when elders and deacons meeting. Anyone who has any concerns, please feel free to talk to any elder or deacon before the meeting. On Wednesday, we have our Bible study and prayer meeting. There, we're meeting two ways, in person or by Zoom. If you need a Zoom invitation, please contact the office. On the 23rd, we're having our Strawberry Social. Oh, oh you like that, Tony? We all do. Do we have any information uh, on anything needed for the Strawberry Social? Just any help? Okay, so we'll, we'll get some information upcoming. Are there any other announcements that uh, we may have missed? Seeing none, let's praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Amen. Our sentences this morning are from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory in all the churches. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals, that you care for them. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under their feet. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening hymn this morning is number 495, Heaven Came Down.
God's greeting from Proverbs 8. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. on that, because if it had happened an hour later, it would have been in the air. Might have been a very different outcome. So, she has tested positive for COVID, which is only an issue in so much as it means they won't let us in visit her. <laughs> but the coronary, uh, coronary artery disease is the primary problem. There is a plan to deal with that. She's going to have bypass surgery this coming week. And I don't see the Lord shepherding her through this to this point to abandon her now. So we are trusting God that she's going to come through this. But we are going to be praying for her. She's watching her oh. um, I'm um, Who 
words. My brother in law was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he's not doing so well right now. What's his first name? Michael. Michael. Happy birthday. We love you. Okay. Anyone else? Patty? Uh, it's always our servicemen and women, our first responders, our medical people, and my friend Paul. Yes. Chris? Just um, my mom's birthday. Stone, who has uh, been running a homeless ministry down in the Carolinas. He's also, uh, he's been battling health problems for a couple decades now, and they're really giving him a hard time right now. So we're going to be in prayer for him and his family. Anyone else? Can I take another one? Oh, yes. Patty is always asking prayers for everyone else, so I would just like prayers for Patty, that she can feel some comfort and know that everybody's, you know, praying for her speedy recovery and uh, feeling better. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as always that you invite us to gather in your house, in your name. Lord, we lift you up. We praise you this morning because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, because you have created us, because you have redeemed us, and because you don't leave us or forsake us, that you're with us even now. Lord, we pray that you would continue to stay with us and to have your way in us and through us, to guide the course of our lives, to guide the decisions that we make and the steps that we take. And Lord, that we would never forget that you are with us even to the end of the world. Father, we thank you that you were with Lana, and we pray that you would continue to be with her, that you would continue to strengthen her, encourage her, to work healing in her. We pray, Lord, that you would guide her doctors and we pray for a positive outcome for a good result. Lord, we pray for Michael that you would touch him. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen him, that you would slow the progress of this disease and that you would, Lord, add, add strength to him to be able to overcome and to function through this. Lord, we thank you that Daisy is doing better. We pray you continue the work in her that you've been doing. Lord, we thank you for the Hope Rich family, one and all, for the wonderful 
things that you're doing. We thank you for the wedding. We thank you for the adoption. We thank you, Lord, for the ministries that have been filled by the members of that family, including here in this place and including in the service of our country. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them. Lord, we pray for all of those who serve in the military or on the mission field or here at home or in our medical community, that you would watch over them, keep them safe, help them to do well the jobs that they do, and that you bring them home safely. We pray, Lord, for Ginny, that you would bless her on her birthday, and Lord, that you would encourage her and that you would meet her needs. And Lord, we pray for Rachel, that you would minister to her according to every need she has. Lord, we pray that she would know that your hand is at work in her life when she sees how you provide. Lord, we pray to Paul that you would touch him, that you would work healing in him and encouraging in him, that you would hold him close to you. Father, we thank you for celebrations and for good things. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Chris. And Lord, we pray that you bless his mom. Father, we thank you. We thank you for good milestones. Lord, we pray that you would touch Debbie and that you would touch Patty and that you would work healing in them. Lord, that you would encourage and strengthen them. And Father, for Dave and for his family and for his ministry. Father, I pray that you would give him peace in his heart, in his mind, in his spirit, in his body. And Lord, that you would cause the work that he has going on to go forward. And Lord, that you would give him good time with his family now. Father, we pray for all of our shut-ins and for all of those who are feeling lost or alone, that they would know that they're on our hearts, that they're in your hands. We pray for the embattled people in Ukraine, that they would find peace even in the middle of their battles. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring a just and lasting peace to that region. Father, we pray for all of those who are walking our streets with violence in their hearts that you would open their eyes to see one another as you see us. To recognize each individual as a unique creation made in the image of God. We pray, Lord, that you would cause compassion to become the, the new standard in our society. On the right, on the left, and in the center. Lord, all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our second hymn, number 458, Daphne Shepherd. <coughs>
kids this morning, so we'll go straight to our scripture lesson. From Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith unto this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Father, as we turn now from your word, which is divine, holy, and inspired, to the words that I believe you've given me, I pray that you guide everything that's said, everything that's heard, that only what is from you would take root in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we have been justified through faith. And so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we go back to the original Greek and look at the words that are used, justified in this case is a singular, it's referring to a one-time event. But peace in this case is referring to an ongoing process not just a singular event. So because of what Jesus has done once, we have peace with God that goes on forever. Peace, in this case, is not just a subjective calm. Yesterday, I did a bunch of yard work and uh, did a few chores that needed to be done, and uh, fixed something on my car that had been giving me a problem. And when all of that was completed, I put on my bathing suit, and I went and floated in the pool for a while. It was definitely peaceful. The sun was warm, the water was cool, the birds were singing. I was very relaxed. That is not the kind of peace that Paul is talking about. Because that is a peace that is very subjective. That's a peace that relies on the circumstances around it in order to be peaceful. That peace could have been shattered by any number of things. And frequently is, isn't it? That's not the peace that God gives. That's the peace that we carve out for ourselves. And that kind of peace, like fun, is not a bad thing, but it's not something to live for because it's not something we can rely on. It's temporary always. The peace that God gives us goes deeper than that. The peace that God gives us is an objective realization that God is sovereign and that we matter to Him. You matter to God. Did you know that? You do. And because of that, it's a beautiful thing to have peace with God. We live in a fallen world. When God created Eden, everything was perfect. And all Adam and Eve had to do was live in it, walk in it, and walk with God. And they messed it up. But before we get too angry at them, let's face the reality that every one of us, had we been in their place, would also have messed it up. For all of the 
has said and from short of the glory of God. That's just two chapters from where we are today. So, when sin entered the picture and brought separation between us and God, the idyllic creation that we started out with was changed. And it became a place where we have to struggle. God told Adam, you're going to live by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have hard times. You're going to have problems. You're going to have to work for it. And yet, in his mercy and in his grace, even in those times when we are working and laboring, we still find these moments of subjective calm, these moments of subjective peace, where we can relax a little bit and enjoy the birds. God granted us the ability to take joy in a job well done, in a task accomplished. When I finished with the yard work and the other stuff that I had to do, I stepped back and I looked at it and I said, man, that looks so much better. And I felt like I deserved the chance to relax. That's a gift from God. Because frankly, if I had looked farther, there's a lot more things that needed to be done. I could definitely have kept going all day long and not taken that break. And I wouldn't have run out of things that needed to be done. But... In that moment, I was able to derive satisfaction from what I had accomplished. And I felt a moment of peace. But what God gives us is so much deeper than that because it's not based on anything that we've done. It's not based on our accomplishment. It's based on His accomplishment. His accomplishment is perfect. It's not based on our being righteous enough to say, well, I have peace with God because I did everything that I was supposed to do today and I walked in obedience to Him. It's about saying, I have peace with God because Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed His blood for me to cover all of the times that I have not done what I was supposed to do. To wash me clean from all of the times that I did not obey. And to make right all of the things that I did wrong. And because of that, I have peace with God. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what He's done. That's why I have peace with God. Remember that Things changed dramatically between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, access to God was a very difficult thing to obtain. Abraham was God's friend. God chose Abraham for a very special relationship. And the two of them were very close. God spoke to Abraham about the things that he was going to do, about things that were going to happen. God told Abraham that down the, down the road, your descendants are going to multiply and become a great nation, and they're going to be held as slaves in another country for 400 years, but at the end of that time, I'm going to visit them, and I'm going to bring them out of there, and they're going to come back to this land where you are right now, and they're going to worship me. God told Abraham all of that was going to happen hundreds of years before Moses would come around and leave the, Egypt, leave the Israelites out of Egypt and bring them back to the promised land. God had a very special relationship with Moses because he asked of him an enormous task to go against Pharaoh and all of the Egyptian powers that be, and to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, which also required going against the Israelites because they weren't all that thrilled with Moses at certain points. But 
as he was obedient to God, God gave him what he needed to accomplish the task. And he brought them out. Moses was one of the very few who was close enough to actually see God. He hid in the cleft of the rock, and God covered him there with his hand as he passed by. And then after he had passed by, Moses was able to see God from behind as he was passing. Because to have seen God's face would have been too much for him. That's one of those things that I read the narration in the Bible, and I'm like, I can't even begin to imagine what even God's back looks like. I can't begin to draw a picture. I've got nothing. But Moses saw it. It was very, very rare and very, very special individuals who were that close to God in the Old Testament. And then, then the priesthood is established. The tabernacle was built and designed according to God's instructions. The Ark of the Covenant, which symbolized the presence of God with them, was placed in the inner sanctum of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the most sanctified and sacred place. Now the beauty of the tabernacle was that it was a tent, it was temporary. As they were traveling through the wilderness, it traveled with them. They could set it up, they could worship God. When it was time to move on, they could disassemble it and move on. That inner sanctum, that holy of holies, from the time that the walls went up around it, it was sacred ground. When Moses first heard God speaking to him from the burning bush, God said, take off your shoes because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Well, this holy of holies was the holiest of ground. It was the presence of God on earth. When those walls came down and it was no longer there, they could move through that area and it didn't matter. But when those walls went up, that was the holiest of holies. The presence of God was there. And you did not try to. When the temple was eventually built by Solomon, and then rebuilt by Zerubbabel and so forth, the Holy of Holies, again, was the place wherein the presence of God was contained with the Ark of the Covenant. And it was a very rarefied place. Literally, the only person to set foot in it was the high priest. And he went in once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he had to go in very carefully having confessed and covered every sin in his life. Because if there was sin in his heart when he went in there, he would not survive the trip. Because the presence of God was in that place. When the Ark of the Covenant was taken out and captured by the Philistines, the uh, sons of Eli thought that they were going to bring the Ark of the Covenant and it was going to be their good luck charm and they were going to be able to defeat their enemies who up until now had been thrashing them. Well, God does not perform on command. They didn't seek God. They didn't ask God what they should do. They formed their own plan and kind of co-opted God into it. And God said no. Not only were they defeated, not only were they killed, but the Ark of the Covenant was captured. It was taken by the Philistines. They brought it back as a trophy and stuck it in the temple of their god, Dagon. They came back the next morning and found that the image of Dagon had fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant. That must have caused a stir. They set Dagon back up, and when they came back the next morning, the image of Dagon had fallen before the Ark of the Covenant and broke. At that point, they began to second guess whether or not it was a good idea to keep this Ark of the Covenant as a trophy. The Ark eventually made its way back to Israel because nobody else could keep it. 
anywhere it went outside of the land of God's people, a curse followed it. And so finally, it was sent back to Israel. But as it was being transported, they were transporting it the wrong way. It was supposed to be carried by the priests on poles. And instead, they had it on the back of a cart being drawn by an animal. And when the cart started wobbling and they were afraid it was going to fall, one of the men who was there reached out and grabbed a hold of the ark and was struck dead. The presence of God was not something to be taken lightly in the Old Testament. Come to the New Testament. Access with God became a totally different situation. Jesus on the cross, paying for the sins of the world, undoing what happened in the Garden of Eden. When he said, it is finished, a lot of things changed. One of them being the veil in the temple that separated that Holy of Holies from the rest of the world. That veil tore in half from the top to the bottom. Inexplicably, or maybe not so inexplicably, because when it was finished, when the price was paid, the presence of God no longer had to be bottled up in that little area that could only be visited by one person once a year. The presence of God was now able to be among people because we had an avenue to be forgiven for the sins that had separated us from God. Peace with God. Now, at any time, anyone who believes can experience the presence of God and have peace with Him. We had a reading earlier from John 16, if we had started that a few verses earlier, had I thought of it at the time, we would have. A few verses before that reading, Jesus tells the disciples, I am going to be going away, and I'm going to be leaving you, and it is a good thing for you that I am, because when I go, then the Comforter is going to come. The Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And he's going to lead you into all truth. Jesus, when he was with the disciples, was with the disciples in a human body. Which means while they were clustered around him, God was with them. And God's power was at work. But when they were separated from him physically, they were separated from the presence and the power of God. Why, when they were on the boat in the storm at sea, and he was not with them, they were terrified and they thought they were going to die. And then they see a figure walking across the water toward them, and they think, it, just when it can't get any worse, now there's a ghost coming. Gee, I really wish Jesus was here. Well, he was. But after Jesus ascended, they tarried in Jerusalem, as he told them to, until, back to last week, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And the same power that was at work through Jesus in their midst all those years was now unleashed through them directly. So now the presence of God and the power of God can be at work in the hearts of anybody Leaves. I'm trying to think which day of the week it was that it was raining cats and dogs when I was leaving for work in the morning. I think it was Thursday. I've got a very nice umbrella. My wife got it for me. It's in the back of my car where it's of absolutely no use to me when I'm in the house. So that morning, I am walking out to the car and it's raining on me, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, this is no good, but another 10 feet, and I hit the button on the key fob, and the car door unlocked, and I opened the door, and I got in the car, and I shut the door, and now I'm out of the rain. And I started
start the car, and then as I tend to do on my morning commute, I started thinking about this, the sermon coming up for the week ahead. I tend to ruminate while I'm driving, and uh, sometimes something good comes out of it, sometimes not so much. You guys can be the judge of that. But in this case, before I was even off my block, God was giving me this thought. It's faith that allows us to access God's grace. And it's God's grace that enables us to be at peace with God, to have peace with God. If I had stood there on that sidewalk next to my car, I would have gotten drenched. But I pushed the button to unlock the door, and then I opened the door and got in the car, and then the rain was no longer falling on me. The rain was still falling, but it wasn't falling on me. First I had to unlock the door, and then I had to use the door to get in the car. And even though it continued to rain all the way to work, I didn't get any wetter than I already was. Neat how that works. It is faith. The faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again on the third day, and that he is Lord of our lives. It's that faith that unlocks the door of grace so that we can receive God's grace that he gives to us. Grace is literally unmerited favor. It's kindness that we don't deserve. The presence of God is kindness that we can't deserve, but he gives it to us anyway. And so, that faith unlocks the grace that we need to receive so that we can be in God's peace. And when we are in God's peace, guess what? It doesn't mean that there won't be any problems. The rain may still be pouring down, but that rain can't pour onto you because you are covered by God's peace. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. God grants us the gift of faith to be able to believe. And because of that, we have the grace, the favor that we don't deserve, to be able to live at peace with Him. So that no matter what is happening around us, no matter what we hear in the phone call, no matter what's going on in our lives, we know that we're in his hands. We know that he's got us covered. We know that he won't leave us alone. That's where we stand. Grace and faith. We rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Absolutely. We want to see God glorified. We will. In this life and in the next. We see God's, glor God's glory every time we're obedient to him. We do what he calls us to do. And we see something good happen as a result. We can rejoice in suffering that produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. It all comes back to the Holy Spirit. We rejoice in suffering because we grow through it. There are some schools of thought that we need to have suffering in our lives as Christians because how else are we going to be able to be worthy of God's grace? No. 
We can never be worthy of God's grace, no matter what we do, or what penance we try to do, or what suffering we undergo. We can never be worthy of God's grace because of anything that we do. It's not our suffering that makes us worthy of God's grace. It's Christ's suffering that makes us worthy. And his alone. But what our suffering does accomplish is it causes us to grow. Because of the rain falling, we appreciate the peace with God that we have. We appreciate the peace that doesn't rely on the outward circumstance that doesn't have to have the birds singing and the sun shining and everything perfect for us to relax and enjoy it. It can come even in the middle of the deluge because God's peace surrounds us and keeps that deluge from soaking us through. The Holy Spirit pours God's divine love into us. You know, in Psalm 23, David said, my cup runs over. I think this is what he meant. That the Holy Spirit, when he is at work in us, fills us so much that we can't contain. He overflows from us. And he covers everything around us. We have peace with God. Peace that is allotted to us through grace. Grace that is unlocked for us by faith. And faith that is a gift from God. Not anything that we have to earn. Not anything that we have to endure suffering to get to. Something that he has freely given us. And anything that we go through between now and eternity that may seem like a hardship, that's not so that we can earn God's favor. It's just to help us grow in Him, to help us trust Him. That faith is like a muscle. If it never gets exercised, it never grows stronger. But when it does get exercised, it does grow stronger. So don't be afraid of hard times or trials or tribulations or things that cause your faith to grow. But remember that that faith is what unlocks God's grace and lets you stand in peace with God so that those things that are pouring down on you, they can't touch you because God's peace is there even in the midst of the storm. Final hymn today is number 504. He touched me.
天。